Please join me in the call to worship. Praise the Lord, all God's heavenly host, and you, God's servants, who do God's will. Holy God, with all the saints of heaven, we, we praise you. And in communion with them, we, we worship you, who through countless generations have shown faithfulness to your people. The steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, and God's righteousness to their children's children. Praise, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. soul. Let all the saints rejoice in their salvation and sing for joy. Good morning and welcome to Central Baptist Church. We are glad each of you has chosen to worship with us this morning. If you are visiting with us, we would love for you to fill out a visitor's card located in the seat in front of you and put it in the offering plate as it passes later in the service so that we can get to know you better as we welcome you to Central. As we worship together on this All Saints Sunday, we are thankful for those who left their mark on this earth for us and for our children to come. Thank you, God, for the tremendous strength, courage, and sacrifices made by those who have gone before us. May the memories of your saints, Lord, be ever present in our minds. I pray this morning that we will learn to walk wisely from their examples of faith, dedication, worship, and love. Come, let us worship God together.
please join me in the litany of remembrance. With the saints in heaven and saints on earth, we lift our hearts and voices to praise the Lord. We praise God, our Creator, for the saints, for saints who have gone before us, for saints who are alive today, and for saints in our midst right now. For matriarchs and patriarchs, prophets and priests, for disciples, apostles, leaders, and servants. For those who by teaching and example brought us to personal faith in Christ and exemplified the blessing of knowing you and the joy of serving you. Lord God, we thank you for those of our church family who live now in your presence, whose lives were touched by your love, and whose memories encourage us in the faith. Terry Allen. Guy Arnold. Roderick Dennis, Jr. Sandra Fuller. Scott Lunsford. Harriet Newton. Michael Olive. Glenn Hollis Oven, Sonny Purvis, and Rodney Van Patten. We thank you for the good witness and faithful lives of these your servants. May the testimony of the lives of all your saints inspire us to be a steadfast and courageous people of faith. In the name of the Father the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Would you join me now in prayer, please? Eternal God, hope of all who trust in you. This All Saints Sunday, we remember all whom we've lost in our church family this year and add to their number in our remembrances all those who have been lost to this present plague the coronavirus, five million or more. And we lift every last one of them up into the loving arms of Christ, who tells us himself that he came into the world not to condemn the world, but so that through him the whole world might be saved. God of our salvation in Christ, you weep with those who mourn, even as you cry out in triumph over the grave. Unbind us this morning from sin. Release us from captivity. Unite our divided wills. Move us from intention to action. And with Lazarus, raise us from death to life. So that we may join that great crowd of saints who forever sing praise to your holy name. Through Christ, who is the resurrection and the life. And who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
like to join us down here that would be great we're gonna do this a little bit different so I'm just gonna sit down here and face you how about that all right raise your hand if you've ever heard of a man in the Bible named Jonah I bet you've heard of Jonah yep I'm just gonna give you a little recap of Jonah's story if you've never heard it then you'll hear it for the first time so Jonah was a prophet of God, and what that means is he talked to God, listened to God, and then told the people what God wanted them to do. So God told Jonah that he needed to go to a town called Nineveh and tell those people that they were very bad, very bad, and they needed to stop doing what they were doing. Now, Jonah was kind of scared because would it be scary to have to go deliver a message from God to a people who are very bad people? Would you want to be that messenger? Mm, I would not want to be that messenger. So Jonah was scared. So what he, he came up with a really good plan. He said, I am going to not do that. I'm going to run in the very opposite direction as far as I can, and I'm going to hide from God. Do you think that worked out for him? No. no. He got on, not only did he run in the land, but he got on a boat. And as soon as he got on that boat, there came a storm. Do you all remember this part? Oh. Yep. And he actually was in the very bottom of the boat. And so when all the sailors started getting scared because of the storm, they came down in the boat and they said, Hey, you don't belong here. Who are you? And he said, Well, I am a worshiper of God. And I may have caused this storm because I ran away from him and I'm not doing what he wanted me to do. And they were very scared. And they said, What should we do? And he said, all right, it's my fault. Why don't you just throw me overboard, and it'll work out for you guys. And he, they did. They threw him overboard. The, the storm calmed down. But what happened to Jonah? He, died. he did not die. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm telling you this story. <laughs> he got eaten by a whale, a big fish, right? And he was hanging out in that big fish's mouth for a while, and he had a little time to think. Yeah, it was probably pretty scary, don't you think? Hanging out in a fish's mouth. And he thought, hmm, I should probably do what God wants me to do. So he told God, I'll do it. Fine, I'll do it. That's fine. So the fish spit him out on the land, and he went to Nineveh, and he told the people what God wanted him to tell them. So we learned a, a really important lesson from God today, I mean from Jonah today, that you can run from God, but you cannot hide from him, right? Yeah. Y'all remember that lesson. We should really pray and listen to what God wants us to do. And when we know what God is telling us to do, we should do it. Right? Let's pray. God, we know we cannot hide from you. You know what we do and what we think all the time. Give us the strength and the courage to follow your directions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please hear these words of scripture from Romans chapter 7. I can anticipate the response that is coming. I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not. Isn't this also your experience? Yes, I'm full of myself. After all, I've spent a long time in sin's prison. 
What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. But I need something more. For if I know the law but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? This is the word of the Lord. for the people you have placed in our lives and how they have richly blessed us. Thankful for our material blessings and the ways in which you continue to provide for us. And with a grateful heart, Lord, we give back a portion of these blessings to you. 
Please accept these tithes and offerings and use them to lift up those here in our community and throughout the world. Amen. <laughs>
you, David Gregory. Thank you, choir. It was, really was something earlier standing up here, hearing our children down here recite the Lord's Prayer with such confidence in worship. Really nice a tribute to our children's ministry and our leaders, volunteers too, especially our uh, worship class, which happens during children's church this, this season of the year, right, Katie? Um, uh, during our worship service. So a tribute too, I'm sure, to all of our parents. You all recite the Lord's Prayer with your kids every night before bed, right? <laughs> Just like at the sound house. <laughs> Anne Lamott is a Christian writer and sometimes speaker who has been very open over the years about her process of recovery from various addictions. 20 years ago now, she wrote a memoir of her life, her life story called Traveling Mercies. Uh, the book recounts her life and lessons learned along the way. Lamont grew up in, in freewheeling California, the child of Bay Area, free-thinking, free-living hippies. In some ways, she had it all growing up. She had educated parents, an upper-middle-class lifestyle, great schools to attend, good friends. She showed great promise as a tennis player. She pursued that talent through her childhood and into young adulthood. She got to go back east from California to one of those prestigious liberal arts schools in New England. In some ways, she had it all, but in many other ways, she didn't. Her parents could be distant and sometimes self-absorbed. Her mother, always somewhat unsatisfied with life, kept chasing after the next thing, eventually basically abandoning the family so that she could go to law school and begin a legal career. There was often little to no structure in the home for Anne and her siblings. Alcohol was always present. Late night parties for the adults, her parents and their friends became the norm at her house. So Anne found herself spending more time at friends' houses growing up with parents who would be up to make breakfast for them in the morning or to help them off to school. Houses with more structure and more love than her own. Despite her best efforts to escape the, the bad habits of her home, it was the, the San Francisco Bay Area of the late 1960s and early 1970s. So by high school, alcohol and even drugs had seeped into her own life and the, life and the lives of her friends. And in more than just the usual teenage Friday, Friday night party kind of way, by the time Lamont came home from college, she was both ready to embark on what would be a successful writing career and weighed down by her constant use of alcohol. She had trouble keeping relationships. She had trouble staying settled down in one place. She had trouble maintaining a house on her own. All consequences of a growing depression and addiction. Until finally she found herself living alone in an increasingly isolated houseboat that her friend was just letting her kind of crash at, drinking and taking pills every night until she fell asleep, her situation growing more and more desperate by the day. St. Augustine was a, a fourth century bishop, Christian bishop in the North African church, Augustine of Hippo, Incredibly smart, he was drawn to philosophy at a young age. He devoured and explored the leading ideas of the day, learning from the very best teachers, finding himself running in the most elite intellectual kinds of circles. Augustine spent his teens and 20s studying and rising through the intellectual ranks of northern Africa and and quite frankly, enjoying all of the pleasures and sins that the affluence of the late Roman Empire could afford a successful young man. He described himself as getting carried along year after year by the, the drunken exploits of his peers. Augustine says that from, his very, from the very beginning of his career as a kind of libertine, uh, from his late teens and throughout his 20s, he was uncomfortable with his own behavior. Others seemed to enjoy the lifestyle they were pursuing in a kind of carefree fashion, but it never felt as natural to him. In large part, he said, because his mother was a devout Christian and he knew she would disapprove. For 
for 12 years, the discord between what he knew was right for his life and the way he was living grew silently inside of him until it became so debilitating that there, there had to be a breaking point. Jonah was an Old Testament prophet. God spoke to Jonah and gave Jonah very clear instructions about what he was being called to do, about what God was calling Jonah to do. Get up and go to Nineveh, God told Jonah. The city, by the way, that today is war-torn Mosul, Iraq. Get up and go to Nineveh and issue a warning to God's people there. Call them to repentance. Tell them to change their ways. Get up, Jonah, and be my messenger. Speak my words to people who are in desperate need of hearing them. But Jonah ran away from God. Instead of heading to Nineveh, he headed to Tarshish and then to Joppa instead and got on a boat and headed out to sea. Now, none of us in this room are as familiar with ancient Near Eastern geography as we might be. So let me explain what scripture is telling us here. The Bible is saying that when Jonah heard God's call to get up and go, that Jonah got up and ran as far as he could, as fast as he could, in the diametrically opposed direction than the one that God was calling him toward. And when he ran out of land, he kept on running, getting on a boat to sail further and further away. Sometimes during parts of our lives, or even during most of our lives for most of us, We can be unclear as to exactly what God is calling us to, exactly what God's specific plan and purpose for our life is. Not so with Jonah. God's instructions to Jonah, God's will and purpose for Jonah's life could not have been any clearer. And Jonah just got up and ran. And ran as fast as he could and as far as he could in the opposite direction. He got on a boat, and as often happens when we run away from God, y'all know what happens next. (laughs) Jonah quickly found himself in the midst of a storm. The storm grew larger and larger. The boat was in danger of being overtaken by the waves. Everyone on board was in danger of drowning. And the other men on board found the one person they didn't recognize, the one they didn't know as well, the new guy on the ship. They said, we don't know you, Jonah, but you have to be responsible for this somehow. And Jonah said, I am. I ran away from God. This is all my fault. Just throw me into the sea and all will be well. And the men did. They threw him right over the side of the ship and into the roaring waters below. They threw him into the stormy sea to drown. And the stormy sea swallowed him up, dragging him down to the very bottom. Have any of us here ever felt like that? (laughs) Desperately alone, perhaps, like Anne Lamott on the houseboat? Maybe like St. Augustine, more more than a decade into a growing emptiness and anxiety and inner turmoil that just will not resolve itself. Or like Jonah, knowing that we're running away from God, finding ourselves increasingly consumed by life's very biggest storms. Has anyone here ever felt like that? I have. I have. In different times and in different ways, I felt like all three. Desperately alone sometimes. Consumed by inner turmoil and conflict. Engulfed and overtaken, swamped and nearly drowning by big, big storms in life. I felt that way. Paul gets a little bit at this exact idea in the passage that we've already read in worship. Matt Markham read it for us. What a wretched man I am, Paul says. Who will rescue me from this body? Paul is talking about the divided will. The difference between our intentions and our actions. The thing I want to do, I cannot do, he says. 
I know exactly what the right thing to do is, but I cannot do it. And the wrong things, the very worst things for me, those are the things I do. I know I shouldn't do them, but I can't help myself. Paul names this phenomenon, this weakness that exists inside all of us. He calls it sin. He says, it's not me. It's the sin living inside of me that causes me to be this way. In my innermost being, though, at the very core of who I am, I'm good. I want desperately to be good. Augustine writes about his own conflicted desire to overcome his his libertinism. I prayed to God, he said, let's remember, this is a bishop of the early church, a a theological giant in, in Western Christianity. He says, and I quote, I prayed to God, give me chastity and temperance, but not yet. (laughs) (laughs) For I was afraid, Augustine writes to God, that you would answer my prayer immediately. Cure me of this disease of lust, which I wanted satisfied rather than quelled. (laughs) Save me from this life I'm leading, but not till summer's over. Augustine says that might be a good country song. (laughs) Augustine follows Paul's lead in his discussion of the divided will. I made all sorts of accusations against myself. I cudgeled my soul, he said, but it fought back. (laughs) Until in a singular moment in his own life, the inner turmoil got so bad that he just immediately fled the house where he was staying, ran out into the backyard and as far away from the house as he could until he found himself in the corner of the backyard and enclosed by a, by a wall, as if he could actually run away from himself if he tried hard enough. This is our experience, right? This is the human experience. <laughs> Anne Lamott, night after night, alone in the dark, desperately wanting her life to change and failing to find the will to make it so. Augustine praying the prayer that many of us have at least thought before. God save me from my excesses, but not today. (laughs) Paul talking about the difference between intention and action and naming the sin that fills the gap. Jonah hearing the call of God and and running away as fast as he can until he finds himself in a storm that's about to kill him. These things are true to our experience. But it's what happens next in each of these stories that really makes the difference. One day, Paul... Unexpectedly, ordinary day, traveling down the Damascus Road, saw a blinding light and heard the literal voice of God. And he was set free. His life was changed forever. In the depths of her depression and disease, Anne Lamott says she would get up on Sunday mornings and wander out to... Marin City to the flea market there that was held every weekend. Just to get out and be around other people, just to try to stay sane, she said. She'd drag herself out of that houseboat on Sunday mornings. There was a church on the edge of the square where the flea market was held. Through the open doors on Sunday morning, you could hear the music. One Sunday, she says, she wandered just to the edge of the door, standing outside in the square at St. Andrew's Presbyterian to listen. She said she continued to stop from time to time, always standing in the doorway, listening to the music, old gospel spirituals sometimes. She said that she could recognize from her mother's old records. Finally, she started going regularly. About once a month, she said, always standing in the back, never even sitting down. Eventually, she would sit by herself in a folding chair, the music of the service enveloping her. And she said something inside her that was stiff and rotting would suddenly feel soft and tender. 
like she was being taken care of or tricked back to life as the music swirled around her. One night on the houseboat, as near to death she says as she has ever been, she says she lay shaky and sad in dirty sheets and overwhelming silence. And she became aware of someone with her, hunkering down in the corner. She says the sensation grew so strong that she actually turned on the light to make sure nobody was there. I felt him as surely as I feel the dog lying beside me as I write these words. And after a while in the dark again, there was not a doubt in my mind that it was Jesus. Just sitting with me in my distress and watching me with patience and love. One week later, when I went back to church, she writes, The whole service seemed to wash over me in a way I could not control. She says, I stayed for the sermon, and before the benediction, I cried. All right, I said out loud. You can come in now. Finally and permanently, she was set free. And her life was changed forever. St. Augustine in the corner, up against the wall underneath the shade of a tree, in the torment of his greatest indecision, found an answer in Scripture, Romans chapter 13. Paul writes, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in quarrels and rivalries, rather arm yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And with those words, Augustine's indecision was gone. And he was set free. His life was changed forever. So what's your story? What's your God story this morning? When you've run away from God, when you've tried to run away from yourself, when you've been desperate and alone, when your best intentions have failed you, how has God rescued you? God has. Today we are surrounded. By a great cloud of witnesses. Both those in this sermon and those in our lives and those in our church and those in this bulletin who have gone before us. A great cloud of witnesses, every last one of them rescued by God in their own way. And God comes to rescue us too. Wherever we are, whatever we've done, whatever indecision plagues us, whatever intentions fail us, God rescues us too, to freedom and salvation. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, our prayer this morning is for you to help us. Help us in our indecision. Help us in our divided will. Help us when our intentions fail to produce action. Help us just to get across that great chasm from one side of indecision and grief and sin and uncertainty and turmoil to another side of freedom and conversion and salvation. Help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We don't end services at Central without giving you a chance to respond to what God may be doing in your life or in your heart. And this morning we remember that God is active in our lives in ways that make a difference. If there's a decision you would make publicly this morning, I would invite you 
to let that decision be known by meeting me at the front of our sanctuary as we sing our hymn together. But I would invite every last one of you in this room, wherever you are, to use these next few minutes to be open to what God would say to you. this morning number one the Lavinia Baron book club meets next tomorrow night at 7 15 in our fellowship hall the book under discussion is the book of lost names join us for that book club discussion tomorrow night at 7 15 in fellowship hall if you can number two you probably maybe have seen maybe have not seen a few announcements already our helping hands ministry is getting back into the swing of things after a kind of necessary break due to COVID infection uh, if you know someone in our community, our church community, or just a neighbor of yours who needs lighthouse work done, just a little helping hand around the house, you let us know. If you're someone who can be available to help with light things around the house for those who might need it, uh, you can let the office know or Barb Walls know. She'll make sure you're on our list of people uh, who can help with those kinds of needs through our helping hands ministry. Uh, number three, on this All Saints Sunday, I want to mention Melanie Clark who is, was the executive director at Insignia, uh, following uh, Brenda Mitchell in that position. Melanie Clark served at Insignia for 18 years. She was a helping hand to many of the family members, of members of this congregation. Many of you know her because she helped your family through difficult times at Insignia. She passed away rather quickly at the age of 46 at the end of last week. Uh, we remember Melanie Clark and her family and lift them up as well this morning. Thank you for being present with us in worship today. I hope we all leave this hour of worship encouraged and emboldened to be faithful representatives both of this church and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Katie, lead us in our benediction, please. As we leave here rejoicing, surrounded as we are by a great cloud of witnesses, take courage as you face new challenges and comfort as you pick yourself up from a fall. In whatever good you choose to do, proceed it with hope, accompany it with prayer, and follow it with thanksgiving. And may the blessing of God, whom the saints have trusted as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you now and forever. Amen. Amen.